yeah. Back in the 1960s, teenagers were always seen as sidekicks and not really superhero leading material until Stan Lee and Steve Ditko broke the mold with this idea about a teenage boy who gets bitten by a radioactive spider. Being denied a title initially and having no other way of getting it to the masses other than telling his origin in a comic that was on its last legs, Spider-Man was introduced to the world in Amazing Fantasy number 15 and became a huge hit, later getting his own comic series in 1963, kicking off the long-running adventures of everyone's favorite wall-crawling crime fighter. But for me, the comics weren't the beginning. My introduction to my favorite superhero of all time was the 90s Spider-Man animated. Ah uh, yes, I have numerous, numerous fond memories of this series. If it weren't for this show, who knows where I'd be, and if I would even be a fan of comics. This show is what got me into Spider-Man, and the Raimi films are what cemented my love of the character forever. I loved this show as a kid, and for the first time in eight years, I'm re-watching it all over again to see if it still holds up. So with no bias or holding back, I'm going to judge this show fairly just like I did, with the others. <laughs> Season 1 is mainly a introduction of the main cast and some reoccurring characters. We get a new villain almost every episode, and while at first glance it may seem like a villain of the week show, it's far deeper than that. It's a lot like the comics of the Lee and Ditko run. I would even dare say it's a straight adaption with only a few minor changes. There's a new villain almost every episode, but the villains have motivations that are a lot more mature than what you'd get out of your usual Saturday morning cartoon of that time. The characters all have a reason for the way that they are, just like real people. But I'm getting ahead of myself, I should discuss that in the writing category. For now, I'm discussing how each season was approached. I love how season 1 is the most 90s out of the 5 seasons. Season 2 things get a lot worse for the cast, Peter especially. Season 3's running theme is fathers, good or bad. Season 4, partners. Whether it's a partner you work with on a mutual goal or marriage. Season 5 is Spider-Man dealing with Avengers-esque events, with only two stories dealing with the Peter Parker side. Speaking of Peter Parker, this adaption is very much an accurate one. He's a normal guy with normal problems. His Spider-Man alter ego adds another set of problems that are abnormal. He's exactly like how he is in the comics. He doubts himself. He has mopey moments. Moments where he doesn't want his powers. Moments where he snapped in anger. He's shown off his intellect and problem-solving skill set. He's quippy as Spider-Man and has had truly heroic moments where he puts himself on the line. This Peter Parker isn't exactly a teen either. At the start of this series, he's already out of high school and in college. He's been doing this for a few years at this point. Which a lot of Peter's life-changing moments in the comics did occur in his college years. So I see what they're doing here. But just cause he's not in the high school environment anymore doesn't mean he doesn't struggle getting dates or showing up to class on time. His social life is still the same as it ever was. He just doesn't get bullied anymore. As Spider-Man he's seen as a menace to the city, but some know he's a hero and just doing the right thing. His reputation is somewhere in the middle with the general public. For some reason he also hasn't fought any supervillains either until this series starts. You're telling me he's only had to deal with street thugs for the past three or four years? That's basically kid mode for Spider-Man. While the show does a good job of adapting Peter Parker, it also goes the extra mile of evolving Peter Parker, having him become a content man by the end of the series. Now that I got past the main character of the series, I have a whole cast of supporting characters to talk about. And let me tell you, it's very expansive. Up to this point in time when the show was being developed, they had a little over three decades worth of characters to work with. Characters like Flash Thompson, Alicia Hardy, Harry Osborn, Deborah Whitman, Michael Morbius, 
Kurt Connors, Martha Connors, but in this version she's named Margaret Connors, Billy Connors, J. Jonah Jameson, John Jameson, Glory Grant, Robbie Robertson, Eddie Brock, Ned Leeds, Norman Osborne, Rand Robertson, Madam Webb, Anna Watson, Mary Jane Watson, Face it, Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. May Parker and Ben Parker. Off the top of my head, that's pretty much the supporting cast for a majority of the series, not counting villains, one-off characters, and heroes that cross over with Spider-Man. This show took advantage of the supporting cast, Spider-Man mythos, and just about utilized every character, except for a select few. Gwen Stacy, George Stacy, Betty Brant, and Gene DeWolf. Betty Brant actually has a character model in this art style. I don't know when they were going to use her, but my guess why they didn't is because Glory Grant already took the position of secretary. And maybe they just didn't have an idea of what to do with her or when to put her in the series. George Stacy and Gene DeWolf, I bet, were replaced by Lieutenant Terry Lee, who is actually a character created specifically for the show. She's an all original character and is a decently developed one too. My guess for who took Gwen Stacy's place in the series is partially Felicia Hardy and the other is Mary Jane Watson. Think about it. Blonde college girl that Peter is initially interested in. She's no science whiz and she comes from wealth. And for Mary Jane, took the place of Gwen Stacy in the storylines that were for Gwen Stacy in the comics. More on both of them later. The reason why some of these characters didn't make it is because Stanley didn't want children to get invested in characters that were long dead in the comics. Gwen Stacy and George Stacy both died in the early 70s and Gene DeWolf died in the mid 80s. Alright, alright, that's fair. I understand. After all, this show is aired on a children's block. Fox Kids. Can't hack that. Flash Thompson in this series doesn't bully Peter, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have it out for him still. And despite being underutilized and not really seen much after Season 2, he does have an underrated arc. Felicia Hardy is the wealthy 1% daughter of a Anastasia Hardy. And I know what comic fans are thinking, that's not accurate at all. I know. And I have to say, it's actually an interesting take the farther you get into this version. Because she's not really like her comic counterpart until the latter half of the series. Even then, she still skips the antagonistic part of her relationship with Spider-Man, for the most part, and wants to be his partner when she becomes the Black Cat. And with this character is when four-year-old me got interested in girls. Can you blame me? How does she get her powers? Well, watch the show. I promise the reveal is worth the build-up. Harry Osborn is a lot like the comic version, not really seeing Peter as a friend until they become roommates. He's a party boy who's initially friends with Flash. This one doesn't experiment or has any drug abuse of any kind, but is he just as tortured of a character as his comic book counterpart? Uh, yeah? God, I still feel bad for him even now. The Connors are a valued ally to Spider-Man and vice versa. Kurt has a big role in the series, especially in the second season. These two are the best of friends. Jameson is nearly a direct adaption of his comic book counterpart with some changes. He wants to unmask Spider-Man because of the possibility that he poses a threat to the city. Different from his comic motivation, but still a good motivation for wanting Spider-Man captured. He was an investigative journalist back in his day. Although he doesn't like to admit it, he likes Peter and Robbie so much that he's willing to vouch for them. He doesn't like to show it, but the guy's got heart. While Jameson says Spider-Man is a menace, Robbie believes the opposite and has seen the opposite. He knows Spider-Man is a hero. Straight Arrow has had a somewhat troubled past knowing a criminal since childhood, and well, you know, back then racial tensions were high. Anna Watson didn't really have much of a character in the series, aside from hating Peter's guts. It's almost funny how much shit she talks. Here, watch this. I swear going to be the ruination of that poor woman. Hush! Maybe that's him now. Get down there. Peter's probably in the thick of all this. You can't put your life in danger just because of Peter's disregard for his own safety. Poor woman. I never did trust Peter. Always gone when May needed him. And now this, that Peter. What he puts May through is unforgivable. I don't care what trouble he's in. His place is here with his ailing aunt. If I were Peter Parker, wild horses couldn't keep me away. That boy is so self-centered and uncaring. Aunt Anna, hush! Mary Jane, I don't want you involved with Peter Parker anymore. Seriously, what'd he do to deserve this? May Parker is Peter's mother figure. 
She's shown time and again why she's a positive role model with her selfless acts, and also she's afraid of Spider-Man and thinks he's a criminal. Whoa, whoa. Aunt May, you got it all wrong. Way wrong. Hey, I'm the hero, remember? She also set up the blind date between Peter and MJ. Mary Jane Watson is interested in Peter from the very beginning and doesn't necessarily act like the carefree party girl that she is in the comics, but retains some of those elements, along with wanting to be a model and actress. Her backstory is mostly the same, having a strained relationship with her father. Also in this version, Maury Bench aka Hydro Man is a possessive ex-boyfriend she had back in high school. That wasn't in the comics, but like I said, I'm okay with shakeups as long as it's an idea I can get behind. Yep, everything here character-wise is great and up to standard. The writing, like a majority of the early 90s shows, were going with a more mature tone, or as head writer John Semper Jr. called it, the half-hour drama. Quite a bit can happen in just one episode, with a handful of characters being introduced in a single episode. A villain with a proper motivation, action, drama, character development, laughs, all being juggled into a half-hour. They really did balance it out with each episode, and if it was a multi-part arc, they always hit you with those unforgettable cliffhangers. It would always stress me out as a kid because I had to know what happened next in the story. It had me hooked. The cliffhanger that hit me the hardest was the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> One thing that I really like is that they kind of mixed and matched ideas from the comics and became original in their own right, that even comic fans didn't know where the story was going to go next. One example is what they did with what is now known as a famous adaption stable. Stan Lee and A.B. Arad rewrote the origin of how Spider-Man came in contact with the Black Suit symbiote. In the comics, he came in contact with the symbiote through the Secret Wars event. But they weren't going to go cosmic that early on in the series as it was only in the middle of season 1. I don't know how these two came up with the idea, but they rewrote it. How it came to Earth by having it be discovered by John Jameson and his astronaut crew, and the rest of the story mostly remains the same. Ah, what a nightmare! For a second I thought I was... going out of my mind? It's such a famous change that most future adaptions evolving the Black Suit symbiote use that as part of their story for how Peter gets the suit. Spider-Man 3 and the Spectacular Spider-Man are such examples. It also paved the way for Spider-Man's newest big threat to be introduced to the masses, Venom. Spider-Man, enjoy the fame while it lasts. The 90s series is probably the most quotable of the bunch. I really like the writing and what it was going for. Sometimes the writing can be a little cheesy, but it's the right kind of cheese. The casting is spot on for every character in the show. With their talents, we got the voices that I would hear in Spider-Man comics as I read them in my childhood years. Funnily enough, I have met one of the members of the cast, Christopher Daniel Barnes himself. Real nice guy and a childhood dream come true meeting him in person. Exactamente! <laughs> and in 30 seconds, I'll be meeting you all. Oh, thanks, Big Mouth. Now I know how much time I have. I'd rather go to jail than to be a snitch. Who said anything about jail? Shocker! You can't escape me! I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! Whoa, hold on, answer the question. Is it a date? <laughs> All right, all right. You can call it a date if you want. Great. I'll be there. I go to sleep for one lousy day and I wake up in the Twilight Zone. Joan Lee as Madam Web is a perfect casting, and I even think that she would have been a perfect casting as a live-action Madam Web had she lived long enough. This role is just better suited for her than the role that they gave her for the Fantastic Four animated series in Season 1 as the Landlord. She fit Madame Web like a glove. The role of Madame Web fit her like a glove. The art style is awesome, and one of my favorite character designs in the series is the Black Suit symbiote itself. I just love the shading on both Black Suit Spider-Man and Venom. A real neat visual of its era. This was also another Marvel show to use the CGI, but not for the character models, just the buildings that Spider-Man swings past. 
it's not distracting and it kind of blends in with the web swing, so it's a cool aspect of the series. Another cool aspect is the spider sense. The colors blare when it happens. What is that background each time a spider sense comes on? My spider sense. Is that what fears could lie in the back of his mind? Because the sound effect could also stand for, watch out your fears are around the corner. While there is a lot of great villains with their own motivations and at times sympathetic backstories, the best villains to me in this series are the Kingpin, the Hobgoblin, the Green Goblin, and Venom. The Kingpin is the most developed and is the villain that has committed numerous, numerous crimes to get where he is, even if it means that a number of people had to be the fall guy for him to climb higher. The Hobgoblin in this series shows up only a handful of times, but is a complete wild card in the storylines that he's in, and a cool bonus is that he's voiced by Mark Hamill. of a man is how he handles defeat. So, let's see how you handle yours. I, I, I'm free to go? Free? Nothing with me is ever free. You're mine now. And so is all of this. The Green Goblin, funnily enough, came after the Hobgoblin, when in the comics it's the opposite. Aside from one other villain, the Green Goblin, much like in the comics, has arguably done the most damage to Peter's life. And I do mean just the Green Goblin, as Norman Osborn isn't necessarily in the clear of not doing anything illegal, but he's not like the other versions where he's always been the bad guy. The last one is the villain that Spider-Man in turn created by intervening and making his life rough, but when Eddie Brock and the Black Suit Symbiote merge, they became Venom. A villain that knows everything about Peter Parker and could expose him at any second, but decides not to because of one of his tactics is to psychologically torture Spider-Man. You know nothing about us, but we know everything about you. You'll see us everywhere, even in your nightmares. To an extent, he's probably the most ruthless villain of the four that I've named off. One of the things that doesn't hold up is the animation. The hand-to-hand -hand action wasn't a good aspect of the series, and let's just say the action could have been better. On top of that, for some reason, this was the only 90s Marvel animated show to use recycled animation. Season 1 didn't do this too much, in fact it was minimal, but future seasons recycle animation from previous episodes. I've never seen this in any other modern show. Back in the 60s, the Spider-Man animated series would do this, but every show of that era was doing it. What, was the animation studio for this series too lazy to make new scenes, or was the animation consuming the budget that they had to recycle footage? Could be either one. On top of that, you'd get animation errors here and there, but that was something that was common back in the early 90s with action series. The soundtrack has been ingrained in my mind since I was five years old, and I'm sure once you're done watching all of this series, you'll remember the soundtrack too. This show apparently didn't have censorship issues, but I've always wondered why they never used real guns instead of blasters. They used real guns in flashbacks, and Robbie even had one locked away until he threw it in the trash. We didn't have punches or kicks, we just had explosions and people tackling each other or throwing their foes. Or Spider-Man would just web up his enemies. And I can't overlook the fact that the Sinister Six name was changed to the Insidious Six in this series. I think I remember hearing once that the producers changed the name because the Sinister Six name sounded too menacing for a children's show. Really? Oh yeah, if I heard the Sinister Six name instead of Insidious Six, I would have had nightmares, man. NIGHTMARES! See, I criticized this, but then the same show managed to have the Punisher and Carnage in it. F of all the characters they chose, they managed to tone down but still capture the core aspects of these two characters and made it appropriate for a child viewing audience. That takes talent, because these two are definitely not for the children. They're in the TVMA territory. So while it kind of balances out, I still can't let the censorship slide especially if it hinders the entertainment aspect in my opinion. Another thing is the pacing. The pacing is fast in this show and doesn't let up for most episodes. It keeps moving without slowing down, so I can't digest what's happening sometimes. 
Not saying it's always a bad thing, but it's kind of hard to keep up when everything's happening so fast, and it's not stretched out enough for there to be breathing room. Let things settle for a second. This one isn't really on the writers, it's more on the directors of the episodes for not letting a moment settle. After season two, or during season three, maybe at the end of season three, I feel like Peter Parker should have graduated from college, or at the very least dropped out like he did in the comics. Because at the end of season three, that felt like the last time that Peter Parker's college life and Spider-Man life were colliding. Didn't really collide much in season four and definitely not season five. Out of the five seasons, my favorite is season three. It has a little bit of everything. Some of my favorite standalone episodes, some of my favorite villains are introduced, it has my favorite season finale of the five, and some of my favorite crossover episodes. Ready for some father-son quality time? Between the two of us, there won't be enough left of Spider-Man to fit in a matchbox. But we'll try, won't we? A lot of Marvel heroes have crossed over with Spider-Man. Some with their own shows, some that have yet to get their own show, and some that have appeared in other Marvel shows. Here's the Marvel heroes that Spider-Man has referenced or crossed paths with throughout the series. Ugh, you don't find the Fantastic Four in a sewer, or the Avengers. Never have I seen the Avengers in a sewer, or the Defenders. Well, maybe the Hulk. Man, uh, Pam, hold my calls for a while. I, I think I've finally gone crazy. Throughout five seasons, this Peter Parker dealt with a lot, and to know his show ends before his journey can be completed really sucks, knowing from the start. Although he didn't complete his journey, he did complete his character arc. The last piece of Peter Parker's character development always brings a tear to my eye. After all I've been through, for once, I like my life. I like myself. And for the first time ever, I wouldn't want to change anything about me. Gee, you're definitely not the same guy I've been writing about all these years. Well, Stan, we all have to grow up sometime, I suppose. Even us characters of fiction. We all know that after his ultimate challenge with Madame Webb was over, that he'd find Mary Jane. The problem is, we never got to see it happen. Now you're probably wondering, why did the show get cancelled? Well, it comes back to Avi. Oh, Avi Arad. Of course, it couldn't have been anybody else. The series was actually going to get renewed for a sixth and possibly final season, but while in the middle of production for season five, Avi Arad and head of Fox Kids, Margaret Loesch, got into a argument. About what? I have no idea. But the argument ended with the series being cancelled. Thanks a lot, Avi. Thanks for nothing. John Semper Jr. had concepts for Season 6, and I'm going to read them off and give my opinion of these ideas. Are they 100% real? Well, uh, I don't know, actually. I'm going to read it off anyway. Okay. Madam Web would have taken Spider-Man to 19th century London, where he could have found Mary Jane, who had amnesia, while in the 19th century London, Spider-Man would have fought Carnage, who was revealed to be Jack the Ripper. Okay, I can get behind that. That probably would have been like a two-parter or something like that. Um, then I'm going to guess that they would probably return to the past whenever he finds Mary Jane and probably stops Carnage. Mysterio would have been revealed to be alive in possession of the Time Dilation Accelerator. Mysterio would have used the Time Dilation Accelerator to open a portal to another dimension, bring Dormammu into our world. Spider-Man would have teamed up with Ghost Rider to defeat Dormammu and Mysterio. Okay, okay. It's another mess that 
Spider-Man and another hero are cleaning up for Doctor Strange. Where is Doctor Strange? He's supposed to be the one. Like, I wouldn't mind. I don't mind Ghost Rider being there, but Doctor Strange should probably lend a helping hand. This is Dormammu and Baron Mordo we're talking about here. Um, two. How, how did you survive if he supposedly died with Miranda Wilson? I mean, didn't he love her? And where's Miranda Wilson? I mean, that's a bit of a far stretch. I know these are concepts and nothing was final, but I think I would have used a different villain other than Mysterio. The villain Beetle might have appeared in an episode. If Iron Man crosses back over with the show, you have a deal. Norman Osborn would have returned from Limbo and took back the role of the Green Goblin from his son Harry. Alright, that would have been interesting. He already knows his identity. He could pose a threat, but honestly, what else could you possibly do with Norman Osborn at this point? I mean, I guess you could take some notes from Norman Osborn whenever he returned in the mid-90s through the Clone Saga, but I don't know. Richard Fisk would have returned as a masked criminal called The Rose and was going to frame the Daily Bugle reporter Ned Leeds. Alright, it's a good idea. I have nothing against that. Since James Cameron's Spider-Man film was cancelled, it was possible that Sandman would have appeared in Season 6. Okay, I'm down for that. Betty Brant would have been introduced as Joe Robbie Robertson's assistant and would have had a crush on Peter Parker. Character designs were created, but she was never introduced. Her name was also spelled Brand instead of Brant. Alright. Would have made things a little weird. I mean, he's married. Well, she probably would have gone after Ned eventually anyways. An episode involving the Puma would have been made, according to online rumors, a script involving Puma was actually written. Kind of an obscure villain. Well, an obscure villain to me, because I've never seen the Puma in any adaption ever. Um, kind of like Big Wheel. Like, you've only seen Big Wheel in this, in this adaption of Spider-Man. This is the only adaption of Spider-Man that I, as far as I know, that used Big Wheel. So, yeah kind of an obscure villain to the masses. The Hulk might have also made a guest appearance in the series. Alright, that would have been cool. I don't know what he would have done, but that would have been cool. The villain Jack O'Lantern might have appeared. Okay. Miles Warren might have returned as the Jackal. Oh no! Oh, not Miles. Keep Miles Warren away from me. According to John Semper Jr. on his Spider-Man the Animated Series Facebook page, he would have done an updated version of Spider-Man and his amazing friends as a more serious version. The episode would have guest starred Iceman and Firestar, and he would have tried to get Frank Welker and Kathy Garver, which he did get Kathy Garver to voice Miss America in the Forgotten Warriors arc. So it wouldn't have been hard to reprise the roles from Spider-Man and his amazing friends. According to John Semper Jr., at the end of the episode, after the villain was beat, Spider-Man, Iceman, and Firestar would have all looked at one another and said, hey, maybe we should all hang out together and be friends. Wouldn't that be amazing? Then after a short silence, they would all shake their heads and go, nah, and take off on their own separate ways. <laughs> okay, this could have been a fun episode. They, they should do this. They should do this. Oh, God. We, well, what we could have had with season six. Oh, that would have been awesome. It's got to happen someday. Now, this would have been interesting to see, no doubt, and more of this Spider-Man is not a bad thing at all. In fact, hey John, the X-Men crew is trying to get a revival of their show right now for Disney+. Plus. Why don't you see if you can do the same and give us fans a conclusion after all these years? Because I guarantee you, we want to finish what you started back in 1994. I will give Spider-Man the 90s animated series a high recommendation. Spider-Man's already caught me in his web. And for better or worse, he and I are stuck together. Forever. With that, true believers and newcomers alike, is the first set of many non-stop, web-swinging, wall-crawling, action-filled Spider-Man stories that I would encounter, with many more to go in my future. <sighs> is he a man? or monster, or both. Join me next time for the 90s animated adaption of The Incredible Hulk. I'm Lino Mars of the MMCA Productions crew, and I'll see you next time.